what they might call like a design Airbnb to one they call OMG where they really just don't even know what category to put it in. Uh, and, and that could be, you know, you name it. People are staying in everything. So that's the first thing is that short term rentals are totally different uh, depending on the type of property you have. These are just, you know, some that you might see. Everything, I think we got a little point here. Everything from, you know, the coastal seaside mansion to this one right here, which looks like a large brown round, I'm just gonna say like a, like a, like a poo. Like, <laughs> is it not? And she looks pretty happy, so I imagine she's renting it out at a pretty high price. People are staying in stuff like this. Uh, but you can't possibly compare this rental to a uh, inner city urban apartment, for example, right? They, they come with their own risks, their own opportunities, their own guest types, all types of different things. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today and how, how that might help us decide if we don't already have a short-term rental yet, uh, what might be the best option for us. Uh, in my opinion, the reason they've grown so much is because it's not just a place to stay, but most of the time it's providing an experience. Even, even if you're staying in a downtown urban apartment, a lot of times it, it creates an experience. If you're not from there, then you get to, you know, smell the smells of that area, you know, see the, the local streets, and you're not down the hall from a hundred other units that look exactly like the one where you're staying. So in my opinion, that is why they've grown so much and why I believe that they will continue to keep growing. Uh, but <laughs> we're living in interesting times, right? Really interesting. Uh, with COVID and all of that, a lot of people are saying now it's, it's an Airbnb bust. That occupancies are down and, you know, that uh, we missed our, our opportunity. I, I don't think that's true. I think, again, it depends on what type of, of rental you have. But I think because these are experiences and, and people are just still discovering short term rentals, I mean, we're, we're like in the, the beginning stages of this. I think we got a long way to go, but I want to talk about this uh, and some of the other concerns that you might have. Like, oh gosh, there's too many of them and it's too late uh, to get in. The regulations are increasing. These are legitimate concerns, but I don't think they should be the, the reason that prevents you from getting into the space if that's what you want to do. They should just lead you into a different type of property or a different market where these aren't concerns anymore. I've got, um, I don't know how I want to do the questions. I'm sure you guys will have questions as we go. And I'm happy to answer them as we go. But I may cover them at some point. So however you guys want to do that, I, we'll just, we'll see how it goes here. Uh, this is this is another concern that I hear, maybe m more than all of them, is just that short-term rentals are too management intensive. Uh, just like Jake was <laughs> saying when we met, um, but they don't have to be, right? They're they're not for me, uh, and I have a lot of them now, uh, and it hasn't been for me for a long time. But it's, it's sort of like anything, you know, I, I have long-term rentals too, and I know that my long-term rentals can be management intensive. If I, if I don't have the right property manager, uh, if the properties aren't maintained well. And so there are tools and things that we can do to make this easy for us. And, and I gotta say, getting easier and easier all the time. When I first started, didn't have a lot of the tools that helped me manage all the properties. My, my team and I manage all the properties that I have now. So we're going to cover those. Uh, this is just kind of an overview. Uh, I want to talk about the opportunities, obviously. Uh, we'll touch more on these risks and some of the biggest fears people have when considering investing in short-term rentals or maybe if you already have them. Uh, choosing the right properties, what, what I look for. Uh, a few things we can, we can use to automate and, and scale 
Uh, and then just a couple uh, quick case studies. So, I, I mentioned experiences, and uh, I mentioned these risks, and Airbnb bust, but, but I'm still bullish on short-term rentals, and I'm going to be bullish on short-term rentals as long as they're in the right spot, for as far as I can tell, and that is because society has changed. That's, that's true. Uh, you know, technology has changed. Uh, our economy has changed. Uh, things are changing all of the time. And people are living differently now in a lot of parts of the world, that much more differently and more mobile than they ever have before. And so short-term rentals, uh, Airbnbs, cater to that. There's a really good book that talks about demographics. And demographics, when we talk about, uh, I'm first a real estate investor, and second, really uh, interested in the short term space. But before we can be a, a real estate investor, have a good real estate investment, we have to make sure the demographics are right. If we don't have people that want to stay in our properties, it's not going to be a good investment, right? And so this is a really good book called uh, Big Shifts Ahead. It's by John Burns, and him and his company just study demographics. And he has a way that they predict demographic changes and how they're going to happen. That's really what we're trying to do. We want to be ahead of the curve before it happens. Just like as society is changing, we want to be able to accommodate a, a different type of society. So he says that we have these four big influences, government policies, economic conditions, technology and societal shifts, that those coupled with people living at different stages of their life help us answer some really, really important questions as a real estate investor. So the different stages of our life, I think from childhood to retirement. People that are entering retirement are often uh, buying things that babies, well I guess babies aren't really buying anything for themselves, right? Their parents are. Uh, but <laughs> These help us answer some really important questions. How much money will consumers have? What will they choose to purchase? When will they make those purchases? Where they will live and spend their money? Who they will spend? Uh, who they will live with? So are grandparents moving back in with, uh, or, or uh, grandparents? and their children moving in together, or kids moving out of the house, all these things really impact real estate and the demand for real estate. Uh, and then who they will buy certain products, uh, why they will buy certain products and not others. I find it really interesting if we look at a place like Japan, for example, the number of baby diapers for the elderly are outselling the number of diapers for babies. So imagine that if you're investing in a country like that where uh, the population's aging and they don't have uh, enough, uh, a newer generation basically, to, to replace the existing one. What, what happens to all those properties? You know, that's not a good situation to be in if, if you're a real estate investor. And so one of these questions for us is the most, most important, and that is, where people will live and spend their money. So this book, before anything, are some really important things to uh, consider because if we get this part wrong, then it makes the, the real estate a lot more challenging. Uh, but maybe one of the most exciting things I've, I find about short-term rentals is that people are not just traveling in, in short-term rentals, but, but they are living in short-term rentals. And I know this firsthand. Um, I, I, you know, I have a home base in Brazil and a home base in Colombia, but I actually just sold my property in Colombia. I'm working on a new project down there. I rented an Airbnb for two months. Uh, and Jake's brother was so gracious to allow me to stay in his Airbnb here. So you could say I'm living in Airbnbs. And that is the truth for a lot of people. Uh, I, I've lived outside the U.S. for a long time, and maybe you, heard, you guys heard like the digital nomad term before. So that's been around, but it's becoming more and more popular, and it's becoming more of a reality. 
I've never seen so many foreigners in Medellin in the, in the city where I live as I have now. Uh, and part of it is because of these things. Um, economic conditions. People are getting a little squeezed with uh, inflation and affordability. And so they can go there and things are a lot cheaper. And so that happens within the U.S. as well, right? People have been moving to the Sun Belt regions of the U.S. for a long time. Like, like Arizona and Texas and Florida and places that have no state income tax. Because of affordability, it has been a big reason. And so um, I find this really exciting and I, I don't see this changing either. And even, <laughs> just to take this a step further, you know, when we talk about Airbnbs, there's more than just Airbnb. Actually, they're not even the biggest player in the game anymore. Uh, it's just what most people, at least here in the, in the U.S. for sure, um, it's almost a synonym for short-term rentals now. But I like to use the word short-term rentals because there's lots of ways to host, our, to host guests in properties, not just through Airbnb. Um, so some others, VRBO, HomeAway, Booking.com is the biggest one in the industry now. They used to traditionally be hotels. But now they've added, and they have over 6 million listings that are apartment or homes, which is more than Airbnb. But each of these listing sites, or OTAs, online travel agencies we call them, they, they attract different types of guests. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Uh, Got to give you my, my brief background on how I stumbled on, on short-term rentals real quickly. When I was in high school, I got a chance to go to Spain, uh, this city outside of Madrid, like a couple hours from there, a little city called Salamanca. And I went and stayed with this family uh, that I never met before, never, never talked with them before. I actually wasn't really supposed to go. I, I was in a Spanish class, and the exchange student that had hosted the daughter from this family didn't want to go back, and so they had a spot, and it was like a last minute thing. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go. Uh, my other friend was going, and it, and it worked out. I was able to go. So I, I spent a good part of the summer with them, and everything was different, right? The food was different. The, the culture was different. The architecture, the weather, just everything. And I, and I left my home, which at the time was not... My parents weren't getting along too well, you know, and so it's like I left this household and went and stayed at this other one where everything just seemed perfect. It really did. It, it, it was amazing. Like, it, was, it really changed my life. And it made me realize that there are pieces of other cultures that I really like that are different from the way I was brought up. And that maybe I wanted to incorporate some of those things in, into my life, too. And the only way that I would be able to discover what those things were is if I traveled around. And so I was always looking for a way to travel. Uh, I would say I, I still incorporate some of those things. Uh, one of the really cool things about the Spanish culture is a siesta. Does anyone know about it? Yeah. For, for those of you that don't know, that is a small nap that um, people usually take after lunch. And full disclosure, I did take a nap today. So I've still got some of those uh, pieces with me. And I've definitely been traveling a lot since then. So that kind of led me down this path. Like, I, I want to be able to discover the world and see if there's some other things out there that maybe I want to incorporate into my, my daily life. Uh, or maybe somewhere that I want to live. And luckily, I discovered this book. Uh, who's, have you guys, who's read this book? Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Okay. Uh, awesome. Uh, this is a fantastic group, too, by the way. Uh, I think it's amazing that you guys meet every month and have been for years. This is no better way to learn than to learn concepts and stuff together and then have people to talk to them about. Same with short term rentals. You know, we went out of the group today, and this is a new industry, and there are, there's just so much to learn. So uh, I've, been, I've been fortunate to have met Robert Kiyosaki a few times at, at some of the conferences. This is also a partial evolution of my hairstyles here. Uh, short, long, and bearded, and the next one might be without hair. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, but he got me to, to understand this concept, or, or his, his book did, or his audio book when I was listening to it. 
that your house isn't an asset. Uh, assets are, are something that put money back in your pocket, right? And so I, I had that uh, theory sort of ingrained in my head from a long time. I, I was listening to this when I was going to college after um, after graduating high school. So I'm from California originally. Uh, I, I currently split my time between Columbia and Brazil. This is other, also probably not the best opportunity to say this, but um, if, you, if you're not understanding what I'm saying or if I'm not making sense, it's probably because as my Spanish, my Portuguese gets better, my English is getting worse. And uh, so sometimes I say words that aren't actually words. Uh, so just a uh, heads up there. I got a degree in international business. I thought that was going to be a way to help me find an opportunity where I could travel. Uh, actually, it didn't even help me really find a job, unfortunately, after that. And uh, I went back to school after working for a little while, and I got an MBA. Again, that uh, did not really help me with my career path too much, but this whole time I was, I, I had started investing in real estate a little bit, so a bit about my real estate background. My first property was a fourplex. I bought that in 2010. And I did the house hacking thing. I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that term, but I bought it, uh, renovated it, and I lived in one of the units, and I rented the other ones out. And that wasn't a uh, short term rental back then, that was a long term rental. I became licensed in California, thinking that that was a good path to get in more real estate. That didn't work too well, uh, but it did land me a job working with a commercial brokerage where we just worked with investments in Northern California and the small team of six people that I worked uh, there with it completed over two billion in transactions. So it was a really, really good experience. We worked with shopping centers and apartment buildings and everything. And it helped me understand that real estate, no matter how big it is, no, no matter the short term rental, no matter what it is, it, it all, always comes down to the numbers. Those giant apartment buildings versus a, a guest house in the back of a property, we can figure out if it's a good deal or if it makes sense by running the, the numbers. Uh, but this wasn't this wasn't getting anywhere with my properties. I you know I I had maybe ten or so units at that time, and they weren't doing that well. I mean it wasn't bad, but it wasn't until I started my first short-term rental, which this is it right here. Uh, not anything super elegant. It's not what a lot of people might think about when they think of a short-term rental, like big vacation, luxury home. This was a, a different fourplex I got in the afterwards, and I remember I was living out in the suburbs, and I was I was having a beer with my my friend, and I was telling him that I was thinking about moving into one of these units. And I was renovating it, I was in a downtown area. And I said, you know what, I'm going to put, for, and I had been traveling this whole time too, by the way, like this, whenever I could. And so I've been staying in a lot of short-term rentals and Airbnbs. I said, I'm gonna put furniture in here, and if I'm gonna put on Airbnb, and if it doesn't work, then I'm just gonna move into it because that's kind of where I wanna live anyways. And I put it on Airbnb, <laughs> And it was, you know, I was joking with him, like, gosh, I think this thing could make like $20,000 a month. And I still have this property today, and it still makes nearly that amount of money today. So um, that was my very first one. And since then, that's, that's allowed me to just build a pretty big portfolio now. And I've got almost 70 properties in three countries and five cities. And that wouldn't have been possible without short-term rentals. I mean, my, my returns grew exponentially. And for me, it was kind of like I had these long-term rentals that were just making a little bit of money, not really doing too much, and I got to convert them into one property that was making, you know, a, a big multiple more. And it was kind of like playing real-life Monopoly a little bit. I mean. You know, in the, the board game Monopoly, you go, you trade the homes in for the house, or, or for the hotel, and the hotel makes more money. Well, a short-term rental is kind of like a hotel, uh, except for we don't have to pay the hotel prices for it if we're buying it as an investor. So I, I still stay in short-term rentals all the time. Um, I have a 
denominated, yeah, I think this number is probably like over 25,000 now, guests in, in my portfolio with my team. And uh, we're still growing. Okay, so that, that's my background. I want to talk about the difference between long-term rentals and short-term rentals here, and how I actually think that long-term rentals are more risky than short-term rentals. And I know that sounds a little crazy, because we've got guests coming in and have parties and do all that stuff. But I want to tell you why. And I guess the biggest thing is that they don't really make any money anymore. Especially if you buy one today. I mean, it used to be we would try to get a 10% cash on cash return with a long term rental, which was pretty good. But interest rates have doubled. And, and even before interest rates went up, it was still hard to find a good long term rental that was earning a lot of money unless we are doing all the work ourselves, right? Like really renovating it or seeking out, spending a lot of time. And so that's one reason why I think it's more risky. Uh, but they also have strict regulations on the long-term rentals too. Again, this depends on where you're at. I'm from California where they just passed rent control in the whole state. So you, you can't, you know, depending on where your property is and how long you've had your tenant there, you can't raise your rent more than a certain amount. Uh, that's pretty strict to me. Uh, I also had long-term units during COVID where I had tenants that didn't pay anything. And I couldn't do anything about that. But if they're not a tenant, I don't have that concern. And with short-term rentals, most all the time they're not tenants unless they pass a certain length of stay. Uh, and then the other thing, locked-in lease terms. Yeah, I guess I, I just kind of touched on that, but we can adjust our prices all the time too, where you know we were seeing huge rent increases in the whole nation, really. But we if we can only change our prices once a year, once every two years, then we're missing out on quite a lot of opportunity there. Versus short term rentals where you change the prices every day. And I do change my prices every day on all my properties. Uh, automatically, pretty much. I'll, I'll touch on that later. But that's a nice tool. So if, if we talk about the returns on a property, this is just a brief example. Let's say you have a long-term rental that's making $200 a month in net cash flow, which I think today, uh, you know, if it was a reasonably priced long-term rental, that would, that would be pretty good. Uh, actually, it's really hard to find a long-term rental now that's cash flow. But let's say you had to change the AC and the AC costs you $6,000. How long would it be before you actually made money on that property? Five years. Uh, so $200 a month net cash flow is $6,000 uh, HVAC system. Is that 30 months, I think? Did I do that math right? Two and a half years? Two and a half years? that you just made zero dollars with a long-term rental because the AC went out. And that's not even considering if you had a vacancy, if a tenant moved out, if that tenant didn't take care of your property and you had to paint the unit again, you had to fix something else, the fridge breaks, whatever it happens to be, it's really hard to make money with a long-term rental. And so I think that is a big risk. It's more of like an opportunity cost uh, with your money than it is kind of a risk, I guess you could say. But, um, so yeah, I think short-term rentals are, can be a conservative way to earn much more than that, three to five times more net profit. Remember, net, net profit is really the only thing that matters. Right? Our property can make a million dollars a month, but if we have a million dollars in expenses, then we're, we're, we're no better off. So, um, some other benefits of short-term rentals that we can't get with long-term rentals. Uh, one is the, the less risk on rent collections, because we get paid up front. So we get paid before someone even checks in, even if they don't check in we still get paid, depending on your cancellation policy that you have set up. We can change prices instantly. Again, I'll, I'll talk about that later, but uh, if demand goes way up, then, then our prices can go way up. We have these companies like Airbnb and Booking.com spending hundreds of millions of dollars to 
market our properties. And if we do a good job, they're going to do a really good job marketing them. And they're, they're going to be visible to a lot of people. Uh, we have easy tools to automate, easy, much better tools than we've ever had. We don't have evictions. Don't have to worry about that unless we have guests staying over a certain amount of time and they actually become a long-term guest uh, or tenant. Uh, and this is, you know, this is a, another good one here. They're fun. I mean, they're, at least for me, I think they're more fun. We, we get to be creative. Uh, we, can des we can design them. Uh, we can use them for our own personal use. And they can still be a good investment. People, society has changed, as I kind of mentioned there. People are living longer in short-term rentals now. Actually, uh, the 50% of all of Airbnb stays are over a week. And 20% of all of their stays are for reservations for a month or longer. And that is their fastest growing segment uh, throughout Airbnb. Tax benefits. So this is a really good one too, and I am not a tax professional, but I uh, talk to tax professionals all the time. Uh, actually, if, if you guys check out my podcast, I had Tom Wheelwright on recently, who's Robert Kiyosaki's accountant, and we talked about this very thing. I'm going to just touch on it, not to go too in depth. Um, but before I do that, uh, I just want to say that I know it doesn't sound easy a lot of times with short term rentals, but it is easy. If you have a property and it's furnished, you can put it online, and in 15 minutes, you can have it advertised for someone to rent it. Uh, okay, so real quickly on the taxes, is that a big reason we invest in real estate, or a lot of people invest in real estate, is because there's excellent tax advantages. And if we're a real estate professional, which means we spend more time on real estate than we do any other job, then we can use real estate losses to offset uh, our, our income. But if you're not a real estate professional, if you do something more than you do real estate, that tax, tax benefit isn't available to you with long-term rentals. But with short-term rentals, they have a different definition. And you can use losses from your real estate to offset other income. So if you have another job, whatever it happens to be, and you qualify, your, your, your short-term rental, I should say, qualifies as a short-term rental, then you can use depreciation uh, and all the expenses with that real estate to offset your other income. So I'll uh, give you guys the link to my website later. I've got a webinar with my accountant on there. If you want to watch it, it's an hour long. Uh, it's really worth uh, checking out. Because even if, even if you have a property making zero dollars, but you're paying a, a bunch of taxes, and you have a way to offset those taxes, well then that offset becomes a good, valid return. Uh, so great, yeah, that's awesome, Tim. There's a ton of benefits, it's cool, but the economy's crashing, and uh, none of this really matters, right? Uh, the sad truth is that the economy is not in a very good state, uh, and, and as long as we continue raising interest rates, in my opinion, it's not going to get any better anytime soon. And that's putting a lot of pressure on uh, a lot of people. It's putting a lot of pressure on real estate investors, or if we're using mortgages anyways. And savings rates are going down, consumer debt's going up, credit card uh, debt's going up, people are defaulting on auto loans. These are all real things that are happening. And I'm not denying that. I, I wish interest rates were still you know, where they were just recently. But there is another side to all of this. Two sides to everything, right? And I saw this picture recently, which is this lion with its dinner tucked away in its mouth there, or at least at first glance. That's what it appeared to be. Uh, and then afterwards, you can see it's just a cute little cub, and he's, he's bringing them home to wherever it is. So there's two, two sides of every story, and I want to talk about the positive side here, is that basically we're, we're in a buyer's market. <coughs> and I've been investing in real estate for a long time, and it's been a long time since we've been in a buyer's market. So there are some good opportunities now, and there's even better ones coming up, I, I believe. No more bidding wars. At least, you know, every market is different. 
So it really depends on, and every neighborhood is different. Real estate is not just one market. But I remember hearing stories of people going up against 30, 40 offers to buy another property. That's crazy, right? I mean, you don't really have that anymore. And prices are going down. This is a reality. In most of the uh, U.S., prices are dropping. We can negotiate now. That's nice. If there's something wrong with the property, we can ask the seller to fix it. And if they don't fix it, well, maybe they're not going to have a buyer. So that's, that's a really big plus, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, interest rates are high, but it doesn't mean that we can't refinance in the future if interest rates come back down. I believe they'll come back down at some point. I don't know when that's going to happen. But if you find a property in today's market with a loan, and it makes sense, and it's cash flowing, and you can refinance in the future, it's just going to cash flow even more. Seller financing is, is an excellent opportunity. So people that want to sell their homes right now, I think you hear different stats out there, but 40 to 50% of the homes in the U.S. don't have a loan on them. People, there, there is no mortgage. And so that's a lot of opportunity to work with people if they really want to sell their home. You can create custom terms with them. Uh, construction's down. If, because costs are up, right? Uh, or at least it's going, construction is going down because it's more expensive to build and it's more expensive for someone to buy the same home, which means there's less people to buy the home. And that's not a bad, that's not a, a really good combination for uh, new construction. So what that's doing is it's creating more renters. And more renters means higher rent in a lot of different places. Uh, I, I believe that a a lot of the growth from the medium term stays, so those stays where people are renting your Airbnb for 30 days or more, is going to continue to grow, and this is going to be part of the reason. All those people that maybe wanted to buy a home, but now they can't afford it because they're, this thing keeps going right now, um, because they're paying that one up, but they can't afford it now. But they maybe are waiting for rates to come back down, and they don't want to sign a year lease. Maybe they're going to hang out in uh, medium-term stays. Oh, and this is this is a good one too. We can take our time and make sure that we're not getting. We don't have the pressure from all these other people bidding on the property, uh, so we can take our time with that. Okay, all right. So that's enough about uh, just kind of real estate in general. How do we actually invest in profitable short-term rentals? So biggest fear uh, number one. The purchasing the wrong property and over oversupply. I know that's maybe not the answer you're looking for, but every property is different. Short-term rentals. We were kind of touching on this just a second ago, but I broke them down into to several different groups for you guys to talk about the risks and the benefits between each of these groups. Because it's impossible to say that one type of short-term rental is a, is a good deal versus another one unless we're actually comparing the same thing. So I broke them down into urban, midtown, which would be like between downtown and suburbs, rural and small city, destination like coastal or uh, ski resorts, those types of things. And then we have this last one that even Airbnb still doesn't know what to call it. It's the OMG, you know, a UFO or the giant boot or the giant turd that we saw at the beginning of the day or of the night. Each type of property has its own management style or, and risk. So if we talk about just management, for example, and we compare these different types of properties, imagine having five beautiful mansions on the side of the ocean. They're all 10,000 square feet. Uh, they rent for $10,000 a day. It'll be nice, right? Uh, but imagine that is in an area that doesn't have a lot of population around it. And do you know how long it might take to clean a 10,000 square foot mansion? And now what if you had five? You need a, a full-on housekeeping team for that, right? Compared to maybe you had five smaller short-term rentals in an urban area or in a town that's nearby, 
you could maybe get by with you know, one housekeeper doing all of that. And so that becomes uh, a reality when we want to scale. Uh, the cost, the cost for these types of properties are, are it's hard to lump them into different, the same categories, but a lot of times like an urban downtown high rise, that's going to be a really expensive cost per square foot. Some of the most expensive versus maybe a rural or small town where the cost per square foot can be a lot better, um, but you might not get as many guests staying there. So it's really important for us to think about who's going to stay in our short-term rental because that, that is <laughs> where we're earning the money, right? The more people we have, the more types of guests that potentially stay in our short-term rental, I believe the, the less riskier it would be. So if we look at and we compare urban, so downtown, for example, big cities have lots of people going to them because they're big cities. People going to visit family, people going to the hospital there, there's people relocating, there are people there on a work project, and so the more types of guests that we have coming, potentially to our property, I think the higher your occupancy can stay, again, depends on the rest of the supply in the market, but also a little less risky, I think, versus, you know, again, I hate to keep going back to the giant potato and stuff, but Less people want to stay in a giant potato. And uh, they're not, even if they do stay there, they're not going to stay there very long, right? Maybe one night or two nights versus a downtown property where maybe someone's there on a year long work project and they have to go every other week for a whole year. So those are things we've, we've got to think about. Uh, and they also, they, they affect the lengths there, so that's what we just, uh, just talked about. And then we have this other piece that's super important, and that's whether or not you plan on spending time there, or what your actual goal is. I mean, if you wanted to buy a vacation rental that paid for itself, that's one thing. But if you're looking to just maximize your returns, then that's another thing. So that becomes really different or difficult. I get that question all the time, and I wish I had a good answer for it. It's like, where should I invest, or what's the best type of property? But as you can see, I mean, there's a, there's a thousand different combinations and things that can happen. There. Uh, I think one easy thing to point out, though, is that you don't have to have a huge budget, and the property doesn't have to be in a super touristy place for you to make a lot of money. None of well, most of my properties are not places that you would traditionally think about. Uh, Oklahoma City, for example. It's not like, you know, why do you go there? To see giant tornadoes, maybe? Because it's tornado capital of the world. No, we don't have a lot of people going there for that. But uh, it's a good sized city, and people go there for good reasons, good fundamentals, which I'll talk about here. And so that is a good backup plan for me. I can do short term rentals there and earn more, but I can also do long term rentals. So, first we've got to make sure that we're in the right market. Uh, and then we can look at the properties within that market, and then we can use the numbers from each of those properties to compare. Uh, so the right market, what, what should you avoid? Uh, right market, things to avoid, housing shortages. So what I mean by that, a place where there's a housing shortage, you know, or where that's very obvious, San Francisco, or New York, uh, or Seattle, these types of places have housing shortages. And actually, the whole US as a whole has a housing shortage. It's just that there's some places where it's much more extreme than others. And those are places I wouldn't recommend being. Not just because they happen to be some of the most expensive places in the US, but because the regulations are usually higher too. People don't want the housing stock going away, I should say the city maybe doesn't want the housing stock going away for their long-term uh, residents to, to short-term guests. Uh, places where people are, are, are leaving. So I'm from California, so I get to pick on it. Uh, people are leaving California. This isn't like a, you know, this is a fact. People are leaving. They're not uh, necessarily 
all I mean, the, there, there's migration happening within California, so there's a lot of people from the Bay Area, for example, going to places around there. But there's also people leaving California as a whole on a net basis. And so we don't want to be in a place where there's a lot of people leaving. Uh, so four things that I look for is population growth. And those are places, I, I think, especially going forward, that are going to be more affordable. Places that have no state income tax, especially because if we go back to the demographics, a lot of our uh, nation is entering retirement ages, baby boomers. They're going to have a little less money. They're living on fixed incomes. And, and especially if they can move somewhere that was you know, maybe cold, you know, somewhere warmer, and it costs them less, that's something we're already seeing. So those are places that I, that I like. Uh, strong employment growth. And, uh, you know, so new, it's good to have diverse employment too. So if we look at like Detroit, for example, they, I think they had 2 million people at the peak. Uh, and now they have like 800,000 people. If, I mean, I, my numbers aren't exact, but imagine that. That's a lot of vacant homes, right? And that's, that's not good. So for short-term rentals, if we're in a place that's growing with residents, it's going to be good for short-term rentals as well. There's people there checking it out, and it's just growing in general. Friendly landlord laws. So this is something we really have to consider with short-term rentals that if there's no rule in place and they change the rules and you can no longer do short-term rentals there, that's, that can be really tough. So I found again those places that have housing shortages uh, or, you know, a place like California, <laughs> I think I'm California a lot, sorry. Um, that's not very landlord friendly place. And there's places where it's obviously easier. I found that there's a the place is a little more landlord friendly. A lot of times they have friendlier short-term rental laws. Okay, this is the hot city list everyone's been waiting for. Everyone wants to see the best ones. This, this is not actually, so you can take a picture of it. But you can take a picture of it to know which places not to invest in. Uh, not necessarily all these, and again, not every market is created equal. But this was a report from a very well-known data source that says these are some of the best places to invest in short term rentals. And I, I pulled up this chart, or this graph, and I was looking at it. And it's basically the opposite of all the things that I just recommended. I mean, these are places that are really expensive. These are places that have sh uh, housing shortages, but yet their average daily rate is going up higher than anywhere else in the US according to this data source. So they say these are the best places to invest. But if you look a little further, these are also the places with the strongest restrictions. And so it makes sense, right? If you have 100 properties, just to make it easy, and the city comes in and says, oh, you can't do short-term rentals here anymore, and they take 50 of them away, but you still have 100 people that want to stay there, they're going to be able to charge much more for those 50 remaining properties. And so, I just glance at this, but I know for a fact that Los Angeles and Miami and Nashville and a lot of these cities have really strict regulations, and so I have to just come to the conclusion that that's why the rates are going up. Um, so be careful with these lists that you see. They're, you got to look into them a, a little more, and the regulations is something that we always need to make sure we're comfortable with. So what's the right size property? This is another nice thing about short-term rentals is that it doesn't matter as much. What matters is the amount of bedrooms. Uh, again, this can vary depending on how long your guests are staying. If you have a guest staying for three months, for example, and it's a 50 square foot shoebox, then they're probably not going to be that happy there. But if your guest is staying on average three nights and they're in a nice place that's 200 square feet, I, I, they're not going to have any issue with it. They don't like properties. So the more important thing to look at is how many bedrooms it has. And that's something that we have access to really easy data and we can find. So if you have a market that you're interested in, you can pull up, I'll share with some data sources you can go to to find this information, to see what the average occupancy is and what the average daily rate is. And those two things together, 
narrow down by size. Those two things together can help you make a decision. What's the right size property to invest in after you already found the market? Uh, so where exactly within the market? Well, for me, I, I like to be, I, again, it, it comes back to how many types of guests are going to come there. And I think the more guests you can attract, the better. For me, I've found a lot of success with places in midtown areas, so where people can walk to restaurants maybe. Uh, it doesn't have the price in a midtown area like it would in a downtown urban area. Um, and so that, that helps out on the returns as well. But for me, I've invested a lot in sort of the midtown area. Jake hinted on this at the very beginning, but I, I always run the long-term numbers first. And another reason why I like midtown areas, still find properties there where they make sense as a long-term investment, but then you can switch the guests over to short-term rental and you can make much, much more. So that's my backup plan for, for most all my properties. Uh, these are some really good sources that you guys can use to find this data that I'm talking about. Anywhere in the world, AirDNA has information on. Uh, it's airdna.co. There's another one called MashVisor, which will actually pull up a property and you can see the difference in what they project from a long-term rental to a short-term rental. Check local listings. That's another good way to get a good, a good idea. Regulations. Okay, so once we're in a market that has those fundamentals, uh, and again, this comes back to what your personal investment philosophy is. If, if you want a property that you're going to be using personally, then all that stuff that I just said is not really as important. But if you're just looking to maximize revenues, then uh, it, does, it does become more important. But regardless of which one you, you choose, if it's personal or investment or mixed, this is a really important one. And this is one that we can't skip over. And this is different than long-term rentals. We have to make sure that we can actually rent an Airbnb as an Airbnb. Otherwise, <laughs> it's not going to work out. So to me, it's kind of, I look at Uber and how you can take Uber pretty much everywhere in the world now. There's some cities where they have their own brand of Uber and they want to use that one. But people really like Uber, right? I mean, it makes it easy. Uh, that's one of my least favorite things to show up in a new city where I have to take a taxi, especially if I don't speak their language. It's like they just charge me whatever they want, uh, and so and it, and it could be like safe. So I think that again, this is a big shift in technology and society, and I know that people love staying in short-term rentals. I think because of the experiences, and that it's going to continue and it's going to work itself out in as many places as possible, but some places will definitely push back more than others, and they might, it might never shift over. One of, the, one of the things that I think is really helpful for us as short-term rentals is that these cities where there's a lot of short-term rentals, they make millions and millions of dollars in transient occupancy taxes from Airbnb. And they didn't have to create a new city department. They didn't have to hire a whole new staff. They didn't have to do any of that. Airbnb just gives them a cut out of every reservation. And so for cities that are already under budget, for them to just go and turn off the, the host state and shut off millions of dollars, I find that kind of hard for them to want to do. Uh, not to say that they can't do it. And the more hotels and, and and powerful hotels are with more lobbyists, that, that can make it more difficult. But that's something that we've got on our side too. Regardless of the rules, well, hopefully you've, you're in a place where you can do it, but it's always a good idea to talk to the neighbors. This is the one place where I see, even if there are no regulations, or the regulations are very gray area, the neighbor situation, if you have an unhappy neighbor, that's where you could run into some trouble. So it's always a good idea to talk to the neighbors. Again, we mentioned housing shortages. Those are places that typically are going to have stronger uh, regulations. Uh, and the policies are different everywhere. And they're different down to like 
the zip code, or neighborhood even. So I have a lot of historic properties that have their own policies. Even though a city on a whole might say, yeah, you can rent short-term rentals, you gotta make sure that it's, it's your specific address that's allowed for it. Uh, low occupancy, this is a big fear, right? And we're seeing occupancies go down right now. A, a lot of you guys have short-term rentals already, right? Uh, I'm sure you've noticed it as well. I was talking with a, a company that runs data all over the U.S. last week. They said the national average is down 4.1% occupancy, which not too bad, right? And if you're down 4.1%, but you're up 500% from a long-term rental, then it's pretty good still. Uh, but it's, it's never fun to be down, and uh, I think part of that is just the way the economy is right now. We're maybe going back to like, we're stabilizing. There's free money being given out, stuff like that. So, uh, But just because we have a low occupancy doesn't mean that we have low net income. I want to show you one of my examples that has what I consider low occupancy, but it still makes a lot of money. So it really comes down to the net income. It doesn't actually matter what the occupancy is. It matters what the net, the net income is. Uh, a couple of things that I, I see, I, like I guarantee you, I can pull up 50 listings here locally, and most of them are not going to have these things. And so there's things that we can do. But they'll have professional photos, but they might not have these other ones here. So there's things that we can do to make our listings better. I believe we really are at the beginning stages of this, and there's not a lot of people, there's not as many people, I should say, doing this professionally. And so we have a lot of opportunity there. Just a few of these, for example, a floor plan, especially if you have a larger home, and maybe, uh, again, we've got to know what type of guest is staying in our property, but if, if your home's set up to handle two families, it's going to be helpful for them to see a picture of where the bathrooms are and how it's laid out, and that can help them make a decision. Internet speed, take a snapshot, put it right in there, especially if you're catering to someone that works remotely, for example. Uh, we have all of these spaces to describe our short-term rentals, but no one ever reads any of that. Uh, they'll look at your pictures, though. And if you put captions on your pictures, they'll probably look at those, too. So we can advertise that we have Netflix. We can advertise local attractions. I don't see... Uh, this one's a little more common, actually, local attractions. Custom map, not necessarily giving away your address, but showing that you're near. Other thing, and this is sort of a sneaky little fun one. You could put a picture in there of an exceptional review you received from another guest. So someone scrolling through your photos sees someone else raving about your property. Um, so those are just some really basic things that I, I don't see a lot of people doing. Um, and I know that a lot of people are not advertising outside of Airbnb. That's a fact. It's easy to see when you look at the bulk data. So that tool that I, I mentioned, airdna.co, it's .co, not .com. You can go on there and you can see all the properties basically anywhere in the world. They're pulling every property that's on Airbnb, every property that's on VRBO and HomeAway. And you can see which ones are on both. And most of the time, they're, you know, Airbnb, it'll be on like uh, half of them, and, but not on both of them. Like usually it's like 50% that are maybe on VRBO and Airbnb. But we still have Booking.com, we have uh, uh, TripAdvisor, we have our own website, Kayak, all these other ones that she can be on. And I know that sounds complicated, I'll, I'll, I'll mention a tool that can help you organize all of them. But a lot of people are not doing this either. And so if we can increase our exposure, then we can increase uh, the amount of people seeing our property, we, we can raise our revenues. Uh, raise our, our net income. Repeat bookings. So it's really easy to have direct bookings now. Really easy. There's, there's companies that you can plug your Airbnb lesson into and they'll create a site for you in like 15 months. And it's like all just automatic. Uh, I know this is a lot of software stuff too and, and um, a lot of you might not be using software. It, it is an important piece when it comes to short-term rentals, though. Uh, so if you have someone helping you with your property or planning on getting into this, it is really, I would say, a requirement. It's something that if you're not taking advantage, 
some of the tools that unfortunately your property is probably not going to perform as well as it could. This is an example of a 12-unit complex that I bought um, that the last 12 months have made over a little, little over a quarter million. And that is versus, I put in, so, so that, first of all, that's only a 62% occupancy, which I would consider pretty low, but again, it doesn't really matter what the occupancy is, right? It's, it's your net income. Uh, and this is compared to what I would, I plugged in my today's rents, long-term rents, and it's probably a little over 100000 Assuming I didn't have big vacancies, assuming I didn't have a lot of, you know, uh, lease turnover expenses and all that stuff, it, it might be making that. So it's still up two and a half times uh, the gross income, but it's up over five times the net income. And so if I'm looking to invest in properties to earn enough passive income to spend time on other things, maybe, maybe I had this goal, I wanted 50 long-term rentals because each of them only making 200 bucks a month. Well, I, I cut that, divide that by 10, right? And then that's what, what I have here. Uh, I also plugged it in with management. So uh, management is another thing that's new in the industry. We have some established markets where that are established vacation rental markets, and those are gonna have the highest management fees. But as you'll see, I, I mean, I've got my own team. I, I don't pay these percentages. And so we can definitely do this ourselves, uh, or we can find people to help us for, for reasonable management rates. And then this is another big piece, is that you can have two properties right next to each other, and this is very different than it is with long-term rentals. Two long-term rentals, for example, two two-bedroom units, maybe the market rent is $1,500 in the area. And you're not gonna be able to charge 3500 for your rental, it's never going to get rented, right? Never. But if you have two short-term rentals next to each other, you could have one that every month that rents for about 1500 bucks a month, right next door to one that rents for $4,500 a month. And that's the truth, because it, it comes down to how well we're managing it. And how well we manage it drives our income, so if our reviews are really good, uh, you can do a, a lot better. So that, that part, um, you know, is uh, not an easy way to change that. If, if you start off with bad reviews, fortunately, it's going to make it really, really challenging for you. Okay, it's too management intensive. This is all great. It made a lot of money, uh, but it's too management intensive. Jake mentioned, yeah, I live thousands of miles away from my properties, and it's because I use a lot of tools. And I believe that you can manage your short-term rentals, no matter where they are, in 30 minutes a month. I, I don't spend 30 minutes a month on mine. Uh, I actually don't really spend uh, any time with the actual operations, with guest messages or any of that. I'm kind of just looking at the, the overall picture, and my, my team handles that for me. But I think this is very realistic for a lot of people with short-term rentals, 30 minutes a month. But there's a ton of programs to use. Uh, this snapshot is, um, again, this is software stuff. So um, if you guys have someone that can help you with your property or you're open to that, it's, it's going to make the management a lot easier and it's going to make your costs a lot less. I'm going to talk about the most important ones, but I want to just give this example. I was on, yeah, this is like a scrolling shot of all the programs that integrate with my property management software. So what is property management software? It's similar to what people have used for decades with long-term rentals. It helps manage all of the tenants, or in this case, guests. So it helps manage all the reservations. It helps manage them on multiple channels. It really, you gotta have it. It's like the foundation. Look at this thing, it's still going. Uh, <laughs> there was 106, I counted. There's 106 different software options that integrate with my property management software. You don't need 106, I promise you that. In fact, I think really if you use just three of them, it's still going, I can't believe it. I had actually one of my assistants pulled it together 
and help me with the slides, by the way. So I'm going to talk real quickly about virtual assistant. But yeah, well, okay, we'll stop that. There's a lot of them. These are the ones that are most important, I think, and these are the ones that I would recommend everyone use. First of all, we have the place where we're listing our properties. When we, we talked earlier, Airbnbs and short-term rentals are, Airbnb is just one way to do short-term rentals. So I always recommend being on more listing sites. And you can organize all those listing sites with your property management software. The one that I specifically use is called HostAway. And it brings all the messages from all the guests into one spot. And I can respond from that one spot and it goes back to everyone else. Text messages, email, or directly through those listing sites. Uh, a guidebook. This is a really easy one. And it's another one that you really can set up very, very quickly. If we go back to the experiences and why people are staying in properties, this is one of those ways that you can easily add a really good experience without having to personally talk to someone or personally meet them. You can tell them that the, your favorite diner down the road is open, you know, until uh, 9 p.m. And, and you love to go there and get whatever it is. And those little recommendations go a really long way in our guest reviews. The guest reviews are super important. Sign now. This one's not necessary, but. As we enter a world where people are more mobile and they're staying in places longer, if they pass that 30-day mark, check with your local jurisdiction, your local city. Some cities have different definitions on that. But roughly, over 30 days, a guest becomes a tenant. And so then we have to consider tenant landlord laws. And so we get a lease signed for all of our properties automatically. Again, it's linked right into this software. So we get a reservation if it's over 30 days. It goes to sign now. They have to sign it digitally, and now we have a lease. And so there's ways to protect ourselves against all this stuff. Uh, we also have them sign a check in form where we ask for their ID, and we have them agree to our rental contract. And that happens for all, all my properties. Uh, and then this last one. This is for taking credit card payments, again, integrated right into this one software. So if we're getting a reservation outside of Airbnb, someone can pay you. It goes through this, the software, goes in your bank account, and you don't have to uh, deal with any of that stuff. So they're one of the biggest credit card processing companies, uh, definitely in the US. Uh, I don't know about the world, but they're a big trust <laughs> one. A lot of software. Um, I do, you can go to restmethods.com. I'll the last slide, just got my website on it. But I've got all my favorite resources on there. You guys can see for free. There's uh, the webinar with my CPA on there talking about taxes. And so you can go to restmethods.com, see all the ones I'm using, and see a lot of the ones I recommend. Uh, okay, so that's great, Tim, but <laughs> there's an awful lot of messages. There, you know, people are asking, how do I open the garage? How do you know? What do I do with the dirty lens? All, all this stuff. And so someone's got to be there to answer those too, right? And I understand that that that's a big concern for someone going from long-term rentals to short-term rentals. But I'll also tell you that there's something that I, I don't do either. I mean, I I did this for a few months, and it's been years since I responded back to the guest message. So. How can we handle this without us actually doing it? The first place is using the software. A lot of the messages that a guest needs are the same. They need to know how to get into the property. They need to know where the property is. They need uh, those little bits of information which can be set up automatically. So if someone makes a reservation for Airbnb, for example, it gives them the information that they need. So that's the first place. Uh, the second thing I would mention is that if we're making five times more net income than we were in the long term rental, we can afford to pay someone to help us. It's a lot easier to do versus that long term rental that has maybe no cash flow. And so you can hire someone, you can afford to hire someone. I really recommend hiring a VA, uh, a virtual assistant. I have a fabulous team now. A lot of them are in the Philippines, some in Mexico now. We're hiring in, in Brazil and they're amazing. I mean, they, they do such a good job, and our U.S. dollar is stronger than it's ever been in my lifetime. That's, that's just fact. It's stronger than it's ever been, 
And so that means it's cheaper than it's ever been for you to hire someone that's not making money in uh, US currency. So they all speak perfect English, probably better than mine now as mine continues to get worse. Um, yeah, they can handle communication for you, and you don't have to hire a whole team. I realize that that's, that can be a big expense, and then also you've got a whole team. So if you're managing yourself, if you're finding yourself a little bottleneck with some messages, then I would consider hiring just one for your most busiest time. For me, that's Thursday through Monday when most people are checking in and out. Okay, recap. Uh, and then we can get in some questions here. Uh, there's two stories to every, there's two sides to every story. Yeah, that a lot of things happen in the economy right now. But there's a lot of good things happening. Society's changed. It's just, just fact. More people are working remotely than ever before. Airbnb, for example, all of their employees can work remotely. And when they made that announcement, they had over a million people visit their careers page in less than a month. And this is a company that has around 6,000 employees. So you can see the demand for people that want to be able to work virtually. So society's changed, and there's going to be a lot of people, more people discovering short-term rentals. I think they're less risky than most long-term rentals because of the reasons we talked about. Uh, finding the right properties, we've got to make sure that we have the right fundamentals. Uh, just If you just chose one, I'd say just make sure you're in a place where more people are going. It's, uh, we can pull up this data uh, online and on um, multiple sources, which I have on my free resources section as well. Occupancy shouldn't scare you as much as uh, low net income. So we can have a low occupancy and still make a lot of money. There's a ton of tools, a ton of management, more than we've ever had. A um, couple quick other ones. This is a property that I got uh, recently. I just wanted to show you. Uh, I, I had never bought property in this market before. This was in Oklahoma when I started there. I didn't know anyone here. I never never met anyone. I'd never been there to Oklahoma. The tornadoes scared me. Uh, this is how I felt a little bit. Yeah, this is still how I feel. A lot of times when I'm buying a new property, but when I look at the numbers, and I review the numbers, it makes me more comfortable, it makes me more confident. And if I layer on top of that the fact that it's in this area that's growing for all the right reasons, then it helps me uh, make a decision. That, that was a nine unit property, and I just converted two of them, and they're not like blowing it out of the park or anything like that, but they're making well over double what it would have and I maybe spent five days in that city in my whole entire life. And so for me to buy a property that's already working as a long-term rental, that I could easily convert into a short-term rental, and double, double my money, like, I'm going to do that all day long. Uh, this is an earlier one that I started. And I just wanted to show this one because this was like, I put a lot of work into this one. And I realized after this that I didn't want to put in all that work anymore. This was before I moved out of the U.S. And uh, it was, a, I mean, it was a lot of work. But, but it does really well. And so if we have the time, that's another thing that we need to know before we buy a property is how much time we have or we can have that we want to put into it. Uh, we can have really good results. So I sort of experimented with this one. It was an eight-unit property. And I did modern ones in there. I did, you know, uh, it was like a full, full blown renovation. Did some old and historic ones. Uh, and this one is still earning over six times more net profit than it was in a long term rental. And on top of this, I had it alone. I refinanced and pulled all my money out of it. I know we don't have that luxury in this near future because. Uh, Interest rates are much higher and, and prices are kind of going down. But that is an added benefit. If you have the time to add value to a property, uh, that one did, it, it's just continues to do really well. Uh, and again, if we go back to having a, a goal for some number in mind that we want, and we can divide that by 10 or divide it by 5 and, and have less properties or make much more money, that's. Uh, 
to me, a, a good option. There's a lot of other opportunities with it. I just kind of scratched the surface today, but if, if you're investing in large apartment buildings, there's always model apartments, right? You might have a few that are always used to show the rest of the property. You could convert some of those and really boost your numbers. Uh, but you can also do, I'm really excited about this one, uh, it's a new project that building from the ground up in Columbia. And it's designed for short-term rentals because there's a lot of people living there, but it also happens to be in a city that's been growing, been growing a lot since I went down there seven years ago. And um, so I'm really excited about that one. We'll see, it's basically, it's built for short-term rentals, but it's gonna be set up so that someone can live there. Uh, so where do I start? <laughs> a lot of information. I know that like, each one of these slides you can just spend a lot of time on. Uh, the, I guess two of the things I would say is just remember that not every property is an asset. They don't all make sense. Not all markets are, are right for good properties. We want to be in ones that are growing and they allow us to do short term rentals. And if we run the numbers, the numbers always tell us what to do. Um, I've got uh, a presentation that I can send to everyone that's just me analyzing a property if you want to see it and I use some of the tools that we talked about. I don't know the best way to, to do that. Or I could send Jake a link and uh, you guys could send it. But it goes more in depth based on everything that we just talked about and comparing it against a long term rental. Uh, I've got my podcast. If you want more resources, they're just quick bite sized uh, episodes. They're also on YouTube now. I'm trying that out. But a lot of information on there. Like I said, I've been doing that for over three years. And it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I do have all of my data compiled into what I call my playbook. You can find that on, at restmethods.com too. But again, I've got all this info for free. Uh, it's just not really in an organized manner like that. Uh, and another thing that we have uh, called the Rest and Investor Clubhouse. Acronym rich, uh, and that can be whatever it, you want it to mean for you. But we meet once a month for an hour and a half, and we go in depth on the topic on related short term rentals. We analyze properties, we do all that, and so that's been a lot of fun. I also have a ton of resources and, and my calculator and everything that I use on there as well. Uh, lastly, I'm excited we're, we're going to be partnering with other owners now, so I, I have built quite a quite a team that helps me manage my properties and I realize that they can manage other properties too, virtually, just the same way they're managing mine. And so we're just starting this this month. If anyone's interested, it's not going to be a, a fit for every type of property, but uh, we'd love to chat with you to see if we could partner and help you manage uh, your properties as well. Last thing, had I ever gone to to Spain a long time ago, I, I'm sure that I would not be here right now. And it just got me dreaming, it got me thinking about things, and so I, it's nice to dream, right? But it, it's, it's good to have goals. And if we don't have goals, you know, then they don't, they don't get us very far. And so uh, let's just keep dreaming, and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.